Now, having said this, I bet some of you are still wondering, is the comparison of Atlas Shrugged to the Declaration of Independence really that exact? After all, the Declaration won the support of the American people, whereas Ayn Rand's new moral ideal has not yet. Now, this is true, but I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's true only up to a certain point. First off, the Declaration and the American Revolution hardly had unanimous support. This did not stop the Founding Fathers from changing the world. Much more importantly, however, although, although Americans have not yet rejected the morality of the Sermon on the Mount and embraced Ayn Rand's new morality of life, they have embraced Atlas Shrugged. Since its publication in 1957, Atlas Shrugged has been popular. Last year, it sold over 130,000 copies. To be sure, the book is still regularly ignored or lampooned by many of the culture's so-called intellectuals, but not so among the nation's citizens. Atlas Shrugged has already had a significant impact on America. And you can, I believe, see this impact in two broad areas. First, it has helped disarm evil. And second, it has helped inspire the good. Take the first issue. Now, today it's hard to imagine the 20th century's infatuation with socialism, despite a trickle and then a stream and then a torrent of data about the misery and death socialism was producing in the countries experimenting with it. Intellectuals clung to it as the coming of heaven on earth. In America, socialism was to come not by revolution, but piecemeal and by vote. Now, there were other insightful critics of socialism, especially some economists, but none was more penetrating than Ayn Rand. In Atlas Shrugged and her later writings, she stripped socialism of its cloak of rationality. She showed it to be neo-mysticism, a secularized version of religion, of religion, a secularized version of religion. The intellectuals ignored or ridiculed Atlas Shrugged in an attempt to evade its existence, but they knew the critique existed. Now, a major explanation of socialism's lost appeal is, of course, the devastation and death it produced in Britain, in Russia, in Germany, and in China. But my point is that that awareness of the devastation was not sufficient for socialism's demise. The socialists were always ready with an excuse. Socialism had not been fully implemented, or we didn't wait for the latest five-year plan to bear fruit, or monstrous extremists like Stalin, Hitler, and Mao have hijacked a peaceful system. Socialism is noble in theory, they cried, but men aren't yet good enough to practice it. We must try again. At the shrug showed that socialism is anti-life in practice because it's irrational in theory. Intellectually, Atlas Shrug made the choice confronting the socialists clear. Choose the men of the mind by embracing capitalism, or choose to remain anti-capitalist by renouncing the men of the mind. Most socialists chose to remain anti-capitalist. They were thus revealed for the snarling nihilists that they are, and Americans increasingly abandoned the left. But not only did Atlas Shrugged in this way help give Americans some breathing room, it also provided them with clean air to breathe in. When prominent individuals in the culture are asked to name the books that have had the most impact on them, they regularly name Atlas Shrugged. The number of times that Dr. Brooke, the Institute's executive director, in his travels meets successful businessmen enthusiastic about Atlas Shrugged and its formative influence on them, has ceased to surprise us. Atlas Shrugged has given men of the mind a sense that it is good to produce. It has inspired businessmen and entrepreneurs by showing them that their work is noble. A significant aspect of the revival of, the business, in the, of business in the 80s and of the technological and entrepreneurial revolution in the 90s in Silicon Valley and beyond is this. The participants implicitly think that what they are doing is good. 
This is a conviction that Atlas Shrugged has helped create. Now at the intellectual level, Atlas Shrugged has accomplished at least the following. It has helped resurrect the idea of capitalism. Before Atlas Shrugged, capitalism was not just a dirty word, it was an unspeakable word. The book put it back on the intellectual map. And so although today the essence of capitalism is still far from understood, the possibility of it being understood now exists. And Atlas Shrugged has helped gain recognition for human intelligence and ability, for man's mind. Prior to Atlas Shrugged, intellectuals prattled on about human instincts, material resources, and manual labor as the sources of prosperity. Today, many more people understand that the value potential contained in material resources and human labor remains unrealized, absent the actual source of prosperity human intelligence. Today, companies and nations alike talk about the importance of human capital. Now, these, I believe, are some of the first steps in the march towards independence for the men of self-esteem. In Atlas Shrugged, they have been inspired by a vision of what can and should be. However, it's true, they have not yet come close to fully understanding that vision and the conditions under which it can endure. While the thinkers and producers of today, sorry, when the thinkers of, and producers of today explicitly talk about morality, some version of the Sermon on the Mount usually still gushes forth. Moreover, culturally, the intellectuals have regrouped. Centuries ago, after the brutality of religious rule, the intellectuals in effect said, the supernatural version of the Sermon on the Mount has failed, so let's try the secular version. Today, what we are beginning to see is the intellectual saying that the secular version of the Sermon on the Mount has failed, so let's retry the supernatural version. It's always a game in which tails you lose, heads they win. So what remains to be done to in fact make Atlas Shrugged America's second declaration of independence. First, we must recognize that the hardest thing in the world for someone to do is question his moral code and embrace a new one. It is not an accident that in some 2,000 years since the Sermon on the Mount, only one individual has challenged that abysmal sermon and proposed a radically new moral code. And this is why we must get Atlas Shrugged in as many hands as we can, especially among the young, who are more willing to question received wisdom. We must learn and then continuously argue for Ayn Rand's new morality of life and against the morality of sacrifice. And we must show the implications of each code for every important issue of the day. In short, we must do the kind of work that the Institute is doing on an ever-increasing scale. And we should do this work not because the world might go to hell in 30 or 40 years. Although it might, that's not the issue. The founding fathers did not create a new nation because the world was about to go to hell. They created a new nation because they wanted to achieve the ideal. They were not motivated by a negative, but by a positive. In the words of Atlas Shrugged, it was not death that they wished to avoid, but life that they wish to live. In the name of what is possible, and on this, Atlas Shrugged's 50th anniversary, let us be grateful for the idealism and self-esteem that Atlas Shrugged can bring to our own lives, if we work at them. And let us take our turn now to pledge our honor to achieving the idealism and self-esteem which Atlas Shrugged alone can bring back to America. Thank you. Thank you.